Well, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Chiu Ki Chen, and I'm a freelance Android developer. Um, today I'm kind of talking about Android, but not really, because um, my talk is about Flutter, which is a framework for building mobile apps, but it's cross-platform, so it can do both Android and iOS. So before I get started, if you have an Android phone, sorry, I have not published the iOS one yet. This one literally like gone live this morning. Uh, you can go on Google Play and you search for Get Ballot, and then you can see that app. Uh, right now, you have to search for Get Ballot together in one word with no space because that's the domain name. And if you just search for Ballot, that's too many other things. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, playing along, so that's how you can get the app. All right. So. What is Ballot? Um, so I was talking to a friend, and we were talking about how people don't vote. And actually, this is a great occasion to shame people. How many of you? How many of you are eligible to register as a voter in the United States of America, but have not done it yet? <laughs> All right, great. Zero people. That's great. <laughs> how many people? Voted in the last primary primary election. Ah, oh, lots of hands. All right, so not too much shame in this room, uh, but please make sure that you do vote in the in the upcoming election and ask your friends, shame them, and ask them why they don't vote. Uh, well, part of the reason, at least, like so, my friend she's a boy and she did some like user research, and it was basically people are overwhelmed. It felt like a test to them. And they got the ballot, and they're like, I don't know these people, I don't know the correct answer, I don't want to answer it wrong. And it's really difficult to get the information because it's all over the place. Like the federal election, you have to go somewhere to see it, but if it's your local election or your city, it's some other place. Um, so she did some uh, user research and built a prototype three years ago uh, called Ballot. And the idea is you can just enter your registered voting address, and they will show you all the different, everything that's on your ballot, essentially, whether it's the governor or the county commissioner um, or your state house, house representative. So that's the idea. And what I came in is basically they were running on like grant money and they kind of ran out of money. So they built something that is very quick, like maybe 2015. And I was like, I love this idea. And I've been hearing about Flutter, which is this great way of building a mobile app where you can build it on the Flutter fr uh, framework and then compile for both Android and iOS. And I also heard about Firebase, which is a way to have a backend without a backend, essentially. So you don't have to deploy your own server. So in a way, I have a hammer. I know that this thing called Flutter, this thing called Firebase, and I've been looking for a nail. I wanted to build something with it, so I was like, great. Hello, my lawyer friend. Can I take your idea and build it up with these new toys that I want to play with? So that's how I got into the project. Um, it's a little bit artificial, but I really like that it's very contained. So it's like a good way to test our new technology without just like, you know, build a Hello World and then call it a day. Like, this is a real problem. Um, so, I am going to demo the app. It's going to take a little bit of time to boot it up, but we will see. So, um, since it actually works on both iOS and Android, I am going to run it on the iOS simulator. So, let's see how long it will take to boot. Um, the idea is that you basically, I don't, I don't have the like, architecture diagram up, but the way it works is actually Flutter is built on Dart, which is a programming language um, created by Google. And you write it once, and then you can run it multiple places because it actually just takes the app as if it's just a blank canvas and just draw all the widgets by itself. Okay, let's see if I can type with one hand. No, not there. I think this is the only time I need to type, so we'll see. Oh, you know what? I, I don't actually need to run. I have, it's like a turkey. I have already baked it. I can, just, <laughs> I can just take it from the bottom of the... I thought about this, that I may need to actually demo. Right, so this is how it looks like. Uh, the first screen right now, 
is the login screen. And this is a part of the Firebase offering, actually, it's called Firebase Authentication. So I don't have to build this thing or get your, your uh, Google uh, email or anything like that. So you can either sign in with Google, which means I'll remember your uh, address, or you can skip, which right now I'm not going to go through the sign in. So then um, I can put in a address which I have prepared one, so I'm going to type that in. Um, so it uses this uh, a backend by Google called the Civil uh, Information API, and it only returns information when the election is really close. I cannot use my home address for Colorado because our general election is going to be November, and right now it's August. But uh, Alaska is having a primary next week, so I have looked up an address in Alaska to put in for you. <laughs> I know, very, very natural, but that's what you do for demos, right? So is Sitka, have you been to, um, to, be to Alaska? Um, Sitka Southern Panhandle. No, anyway, so you type in your registered voting address and then the app will query the Google API and then come back and tell you, oh, your next election is the Alaska primary election and it's going to be on this date and this is where you can vote. Um, and then. If you click on uh, the, the icon, it will take you to maps, essentially. So that's the app right now. Um, and I will do some more demo later, but uh, let's get back to the slides. So that's the end result. So what you saw was running on an iOS simulator, which uh, the same app will look exactly the same on Android as well. You can, like I said, if you download it, you can try it out. I'm not going to also put up the uh, Android emulator because it will turn into a jet engine on my little Mac if I try to run both at the same time. So yeah, what is Flutter then? So that's the, that's the framework that I used to build that mobile app. Uh, if I go to the website, this is what it says. Beautiful native apps in record time. <laughs> uh, so what I care about is that it does both Android and iOS. And indeed, like that whole app, I built it in one month, essentially, and with uh, my consulting still going on. And that's both front end and back end. So the back end is the Firebase back end that I've been talking, telling you about. And I'll tell you more later in the talk, but at the end, I end up actually learning a lot more JavaScript than doing the and because the way I structure the app, the app is kind of like a window to the back end. So all the logics in the back end, which is run on Node.js, well, it's, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. So it's a cloud functions, which is uh, powered by Node.js. So the nice thing about Flutter is that it does cross-platform, meaning both iOS and Android. Um, basically, when I heard that, I was like, oh, the holy grail of right one deploy everywhere, right? We have heard this before, right? <laughs> That's too good to be true. I heard about Cordova, Titanium, React Native, Ionic, you name it. There's so many of them. And basically all of them work like this. That's your app. You write it in JavaScript. Well, most of it. I mean, some of them is in C Sharp. But the same idea is that you are writing your app in some language, and then there's a bridge. Like in the case of, like, for example, React Native, there's a bridge from JavaScript to the platform, and then that's your bottleneck. And that's the part that is slow. <laughs> it's marshalling the data between the platform and your app. And I'm just like, yet another one of these? Uh, but Flutter is different. So Flutter, the way they structure is actually, everything is actually native code in the sense that you're writing it in Dart, but it gets compiled to uh, ARM code, machine code. And so then they ask, then how do you do widgets, right? Like if I have a button, how am I not telling the platform to do this button for me from Dart? Well, they don't. Essentially, it's just your app is just one blank screen, and they draw every single puzzle, uh, pixel on it. They do all the animation, all the click to pretend that it's iOS or Android. Um, so it's nice, it's a performant, because there is no bridge. There's no snail crawling across that, that bridge between, between your non-native code and the platform. And the other thing that they did really well is um, they have this notion of a hot reload. 
meaning that they have the dot VM running while you're debugging, and whenever you have a change, they are actually smart enough to make a diff of like the previous UI and your new UI, and they send over and say, oh, this part of the UI tree changed, re-render this, um, and they do that for logic as well. And when they do that, they actually keep the state. So you may be you know, clicking and typing all these things, and then you're like, well, you know what? I want this icon to be pink, because why not? And then you change it to pink, and then bam, it changed to pink the rest of the um, UI state, the same state as you type, which is amazing. But during release, they don't do that. <laughs> during release, you don't need that hot reload load. So it actually can compile down to machine code, as actually what I showed you, uh, running is actually not even the compile code, it is the hot reload version. And it's, it's, you can't tell, it's not like, oh, I know that there's some funky JavaScript going on. Sometimes when you use an app that's just like, it looks like an app, but actually it's just a web view inside a container. You can tell. Whereas my experience with Flutter, you can't tell. It's been very, very smooth. So that is like a pro and a con as well. So the, the reason why they did that is so that they can have the performance. But the flip side is that because they re-implemented all the UI widgets on both platforms, so if Google roll a new version, like the Flutter team will have to go make that widget look like the new one, otherwise your app will look very dated. Well, currently Google is very excited about Flutter and they are on top of things, but we don't know when they are going to stop being excited about this shiny new toy. Of course, the team tells you that you're not beholden to that. Right? You, the framework is actually built, it's very usable. All the widgets are composable. Um, so and when I do a more demo, I will tell you how some of the widgets are is specified. Uh, so you build from different parts of the widget and you can build your own. So they are like, if not really, you're not really tied to them, but I'm like, I'm not convinced yet. So right now I like using it for very, very specific purpose app that I know that I'm not going to be like every month there will be a new feature coming in that I have to like keep maintaining it. There's something that's like the the voting app, which I'm building essentially for November and maybe next year's election, and that kind of app, I, I think Flutter is a great fit for. So that's the Flutter side of things. So uh, my title was Flutter plus Firebase. So now what is Firebase? This is what the website says. What? Uh, that does not mean anything at all. So Firebase is an umbrella of offerings. There's a lot of different things. So the parts that I use, I already show you the authentication. So on top of that, I also use Cloud Firestore and Cloud Functions. Cloud Firestore is a NoSQL database. So that's where all the data is stored. And then, okay. Uh, and then Cloud Function is basically you can have logic without running your own server. So let's kind of dissect that a little bit. I had a lot of difficulty understanding a NoSQL database because I am more used to a relational database where you have a table, you have a row, you have a key, and then when you want to refer to something else, you have a foreign key, etc. So I was just really banging my head, what do you mean by it's a document? I don't understand. Uh, so I find a friend that actually uh, is he has a consultancy business and he uses Firebase for a lot of the projects. So, like, so what's the deal? And this insight was super useful. So he told me, don't think about the relation between your objects inside a database. Think about each document is essentially a screen on the UI, whether that screen is on the phone or on the web page. Then I was like, oh, okay, so I know for some of the screen I show you, it has the voting information, it has like the location and whatnot. So that's my document. And that's good, but the other insight is you are optimizing for read and not write. Because I was freaking out, absolutely freaking out, because you are duplicating data. Right? Because what happened here is the screen that I show you about where you go vote, depending on your address, I'm pulling in data from, like, oh, you're in Colorado, so that means you, uh, you need to vote for the governor, but you are in Boulder County, so you're also going to be voting for the Boulder County Corona or something, I don't know, a sector. I know all the positions, I don't know what they do, <laughs> just because I've been like, filling in the database. But anyway, so I have one copy of that, that I copy over every time someone lives in Boulder County wants to see that, because her view, 
it's going to be a composite of these different locations, right? Because it could be if I I live in Wild County, so I will have the same Colorado state level contest I need to vote for, but the Wild County ones. So instead of like reaching out and looking at that one canonical place, I'm copying over so that me personally have a document so that when I look at my screen, that's the document is me. And I was really not happy about that. <laughs> that the data was copied everywhere, and it's like, don't worry, think about it. How many times you read, and how many times you write? Right? Like, how many times does the election information change? Versus how many individuals are going to be reading? And if you're compositing on the fly every single time, it's actually not efficient. And in this day and age, storage is actually not that expensive. So I was like, OK. You have kind of convinced me. And now I'm convinced. Now that I've built out the whole app, like, this is actually not too difficult mental model, it's just I was kind of locked in my own ways. So that's another insight that I really want to share with you in case you're also trying to venture into the world of NoSQL. Um, so this is just a visual representation of what I just said. So the app, this is the screen, and what it corresponds to exactly is this Firebase backend object that I, you can look at the top, it has the Path essentially of this document, so it's user and then my you know very funky username, elections and upcoming. So it's the upcoming election for me, this user, and then it has everything composite together: the election date and where I can go vote. So the next question is, how do I make that document? I told you I need to go assemble all these different things together, and that's where cloud functions come in. So cloud function is serverless, <laughs> which is very confusing to me. Like, how, but code needs to run somewhere. How can you not have a, wait, what? Uh, so what serverless means is essentially um, the servers are spinning up on demand. It's not, doesn't mean that there's no server. There's no server that's always running. That's all it means. I'm like, what, why do you say server? Anyway, um, so it just runs on trigger. So if your server's not running, um, I mean, of course, if you have always like incoming requests, then you will have an instance always running, but that's all it means. It just means you don't think about, oh, I'm going to deploy this server that can handle this request. You think about what are the incoming triggers that will cause some computation to happen. So let me show you how I use Cloud Function in my app. And one thing that I, I, I don't know if I invented or whatnot, but like, that's what I call it, it's like an inbox, outbox, because again, it was very confusing, I don't know how to think about it, how do I make these triggers. Basically, in the cloud-based, cloud-based, no, Firebase cloud function, this, these words are all mangled in my head, um, what it does is, it can, you can have different triggers, you can have an incoming HTTP request, you can also have, if someone writes to a specific location in your database, you can trigger. So I was like, oh great, you know, I am going to have this document, you will have your voting location and also your all your different races that you're voting for. But then I run into this problem that you're observing the thing that you're changing. So it's just like bouncing infinitely. So then I come up with this kind of inbox outbox um, model, which essentially is this. So I have this app and it writes to this specific location I call triggers. Uh, so, so that when I type in the address in Sitka, Alaska, this is where it writes to. And then I have the cloud function watching this location. And it goes and takes this address and talk to the Civic API and convert that into essentially your election information. Then, instead of writing in the exact same location, it writes back to a different place called Civic Information which is what I'm calling the inbox outbox. So the inbox is the address, so it's like if you picture yourself sitting at a desk and there's like this file um, folder thing that your secretary come in and put in the document, and you're the boss, and you say, oh, that's a document, you take it out, you sign. That's why I think when I was a kid, that's what bosses do, they sign documents. So <laughs> you take it out of the inbox and then you sign, and then you put it on the outbox, and then the secretary is watching the outbox, and then, oh, the boss signed the thing, so then she take it, no, that's sexist. They take it, and, and then they move on with their life. So, so that's, that's how I'm, I'm, that's the mental model that I use for cloud function. Is I have a specific location that I write to, I only write to that, I don't read from it. And then I have a specific location that it writes to, that 
then get watched. So that the civic information contains, if there is an upcoming election, then Google will tell you right away that, oh, there is an election, this is the information. If not, um, I can ask it to uh, tell me which are my voting districts. So like, I'm in Colorado, I'm in Weld County, I'm in State House 63, that kind of stuff. So then I actually have my own database, which then I meticulously type in <laughs> in November who is running for House District 63 uh, so that I can do that composite all by myself. And I go through, look at all your voting districts, and I put it together. And then I write it to this other location called Elections Upcoming, which I showed you earlier. And the UI is watching that location. So that's how the UI updates. So finally, some code. I've been showing you pretty diagrams. Uh, so this is how cloud function looks like. Like I said, it's Node.js, which took me a long time to understand what is a promise. I'm not going to have time to explain to you what is a JavaScript promise, uh, but that's how the whole thing is run. This uh, basically you have to always return a promise, otherwise the cloud function is like I'm done, but you're not done. So I have this helper function that does that. But let's break it up. So what you're telling Firebase Cloud Function is that, hey, keep an eye on this location. And I have some wildcard, so it could be any user ID. When someone writes to this location, um, if it doesn't exist anymore, then it means somebody like deleted the account. Then I'll go ahead and delete everything else. And otherwise, I have this helper function called fetch civic information, which will go out to the Google a specific API and then write to this specific location and it returns a promise so that the cloud function knows that I should not just close shop and call it a day, like I am waiting for something to happen. So that's kind of very high level. The whole talk is pretty high level. Like what I wanted to show you is like all the high level insight that I wish somebody told me <laughs> before I build this app. Uh, but I do want to show you some demo because I think, at least to me, like that's what makes things real. So the way the app that I showed you earlier, like how that watches the space of the upcoming election is this. So there's this notion of a stream. Uh, I don't really know how to explain that because I just learned that. Essentially, it's a stream of data that keeps coming in. Then you, can, you can think of it as an event, right? Like, so every time the document changes, so I call this stream builder, right? I said watch a stream, and whenever this changes, use this builder to update the UI. And what I'm watching is a Firebase real-time database. Again, the same location, right? Like user, user ID, and then the elections upcoming. So let me just go straight to the demo. I think it's more exciting. Right, so this is how the back end looks like. Is it big enough? Should I make the font bigger? All right, so I believe that's the one that I put in. No, it's not. Okay, that's the problem. I don't actually know all these very interesting strings, which one corresponds to the one in Sitka that I just put in. Aha, so this is the one. So this is how it's stored in the back end. And because I have this stream going, if I change here, this UI should update. All right, let's all pray to the demo gods and that this works. <laughs> Okay, I need to put this down. So Wyoming is, uh, oh no, I did it the wrong way. I was supposed to do it on the back end and then the front end should update. Uh, but you see the update on the back end, right? Okay, um, uh, we can also try a live address. Uh, but the, the idea that I want to show you is basically for the Firebase um, cloud database, it, it takes care of the syncing between the client and the server for you. You don't need to do anything. It just 
does that. Um, so then it, it fetches the Wyoming primary election, and then right now it's showing duplicates because it's a primary election, and one is for Democrat, one is for Republican. I haven't added the UI to say which party do you want to see. Um, there is a GitHub issue if people want to contribute. Hint, hint, so funny. If you want to run a I am more than happy to help you get started. Uh, so I'm just going to do one more because I want to do it the other way. That was the plan. So this feels more magical because uh, the, if you're holding your phone, it'll be just like, wait, what? It updated. Um, again, like it's a very rough version. I wanted to have a spinny before it updated so that the old data is not being shown anymore. But ta-da! You can see that now it says Colorado general election, and it has the governor's secretary of state, and Firestone is in Congressional District 4, so it's in Congressional District 4. And I also implemented favorites, so you can go and see a candidate and say, oh yeah, I want to vote for her, let me remember that. So then when I do that, let me see, right now it's not updating unless I click, so I'm going to click. So you see the faves object um, collection that got created? So I keep track of who you are favoring with this funky string because I want a stable ID, essentially. So that, for some reason, if you move between primary election and, and the actual election, you're not in Firestone anymore, but you're still in Congressional District 4, like I will remember your favorites. So that's the demo. I just really want to show you how real-time is the real-time database. Because Firebase really stresses that as like their strength. And before I built a network, whatever, you know, just marketing, yada yada. But when I did, I was like, whoa, <laughs> it is real time. All right, back to the slides. Oh yeah, bonus demo. <laughs> right, so the bonus demo is actually I went to an event where we are trying to build a Google Action. And because a lot of the logic is done in the Firebase Cloud function. I actually managed to do exactly, it's not exactly the same, but like pretty much the same functionality on the Google Home, which I brought. By the way, the mic's off. I know. Turn it back on. Mic's back on. And you're here. Okay, Google. Talk to about it, guy. Valid guy isn't responding right now. Try again soon. <laughs> Sorry, live demo. I'm going to try it two more times and then we'll move on. Okay, Google, talk to Valid Guy. All right, getting Valid Guy. Welcome back. Would you like to hear about the next election? Change my address. To get your valid information, I just need to check your location. Can I get that from Google? Sure. What is your registered voting address? 326 Jackson Avenue, Firestone, Colorado. Got it. 326 Jackson Avenue, Firestone, Colorado, 80520, USA. Would you like to know more about the next election? Okay. I found VIP test election on the 6th of June 2021. Would you like to know more about voting location? That's a fact. Sure. <laughs> you can go to the National Guard Armory. Would you like to know more about contests? No. <laughs> Thank you for using Ballot Guide. Remember to vote. So it's because the back end is exactly the same, it has the exact same problem. Right? Remember when I was doing it on the mobile app, it was showing the old uh, election information. That's why I was telling you about the VIP test election, even though I gave you a new address. 
So, like I said, there's a GitHub repository and there are issues. So how does that work? Um, it's exactly the same, right? This whole diagram, all I need to do is to change that front end. Do you even see that change? Oh, let's do it again. It was an app. Now it's Google Home. And that's it. I mean, the input was by voice, but I did exactly the same thing. The Google Action writes to that specific trigger address that I call a trigger address. You don't have to do that. But a specific location that the cloud function watches and then fetch the information. So what's next besides fixing all the bugs? Um, I need to have more data. So right now, like I said, the Google API only shows you information when it's maybe a week or two before the election. And for me, that's a bit late, because if you are trying to get people to vote, a week or two, how many people can you reach realistically? I mean, sure, you can buy Twitter ad promotion I don't even know what they're called, um, the tweets that, to promote the tweets uh, or something. But if you want to actually knock on doors and talk to people, a week or two is not enough. So I have the, my own database that I'm inputting who is running and uh, where are the websites and whatnot. And one thing I wanted to add is endorsements because people do get overwhelmed about uh, who should we vote for. And a shortcut that people like to take is endorsements, right? If you see a candidate that is endorsed by the NLA, you will make decision one way or the other. I'm not going to make any assumption about this group. Uh, so another, another thing that I don't think I'll get to is like one of the things that my friend, the lawyer who started all this, she told me the initial idea, which was really cool, is basically Tinder for politics. So, you get asked questions like, do you think the government should spend more money on public education? And you swipe left or right, depending if you agree or not. And then you get asked about the environment, you get asked about healthcare and all these like, issues. And then the candidates answer the same questions. Now, whether they actually personally answer the question or you go, like the team go research and like, get their position on that. Either way, we can get a compatibility score, right? So like, I think that the government should spend more money on public education, and so that this candidate, and you know, we have a 70% match on the, the answers. So that's like a great way if you are like, I don't know the answer to this quiz. I don't want to vote for these strangers that I don't know. But that's a quick way, because you answer the same question once, and then we can tell you who are the compatible candidates. I don't think I can get to that before November. But who knows? Maybe some of you want to help. Um, so, what? 2020? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, right. That's more election than November. Uh, so anyway, so that's, that's one thing. And then another thing I want to do is, like, I don't know how much you can hear over our laughter of my butt over Google Home, but the conversation is a bit forced right now, as I am not a conversation expert. I just want this to work. So it, it's like very mechanical, so I want to make it a, a flow a little bit better, because I do think that the Google Home can reach certain people that don't normally would use a phone to get the information. So if you can just have it talk conversationally about oh, when is my next election, and where can I vote? Even if I don't give them any endorsement or any candidate information or compatibility quiz, I feel like that is still a good service. Right? If I can just tell them, oh, go vote at the courthouse or, or whatever, and then tell them the address. So I, I do want to spend some more time on that. And that's it. Thank you very much. Kelly never told me how much time I have, so I don't know whether there's time for questions. I have five minutes. Do we have questions? Yes. Sorry about that. I am wondering database side of it. So you have your own divisions database. Did you say that you actually build the database? Yes, I build the database. <laughs> that will be fine then. <laughs> so when you were building the database, what did you what, what was your resources? How did you build the database? How did I build my database? So I went to the Secretary of State of Colorado and after the primaries there were actually CSV files that you can download. 
So I downloaded the CSV files that has the candidate names and the parties, and sometimes a website, sometimes not. I try to parse that and put that into my database. Uh, but I do want more than just the name and the party. I want if they have a Twitter account, if they have an Instagram account, I want all that. So I did I did the research for Boulder County and Wells County, and I'm done. I'm so tired of it. I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, but my friend, uh, so she is the one that has the original idea. She's she's in DC. Uh, she said, you know what? Maybe I can write a grant and we can hire interns. I'm like. Yay, lawyer friend. <laughs> As a developer, I don't think like that. Uh, so we will see how far we will get. But I think we at least want, um, like I said, Boulder and Wells County, just because I have a lot of friends in Boulder County. I live in Wells County, and she wants to do her hometown. So it's a relational data. It's not relational. Not, not no, relational. not relational. It's okay. no sequel. Oh, good for you for doing it by hand. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. All right. Let me show you the part that I did. I, thought I don't have time for, is actually done this way. Um, go to my GitHub. I have data ingestion. So it's essentially, I type this in on a Google Sheet. So it's, like, it has columns of the candidate name, like wh which district they're in, which race they're running. And then this is a uh, the Firebase Node.js interface is the same. It reads it in, and then it figure out the path and where exactly things need to go. And then there's another function that collects data and propagates it to the right place. Thank you. It is still tedious, but not as tedious as typing in the exact nodes in the exact place on the NoSQL database. Okay, we have time for one more question. Anybody? Um, so if you do get um, more people, I guess, to collect data, is there a way to, I guess, prioritize people or counties that are in more contentious areas? So like, I guess, more like purple areas. Well, I have not thought about that. <laughs> I I literally just made an algorithm today. I think it. It depends on whether there are other people who would like to promote this app and where they want to promote it. Uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg, right? Because if there's no data, then they can't promote it. But if I don't have people, then I don't see any point in putting in the data. Yeah, I'm from Houston, so um, I'm uh, like really interested in like helping. Um, I don't know. Like, I will like, get your email address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, places where like your vote really I will definitely get your email address. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're out of time, but I just want to say one more thing, which is uh, I also run GDG Boulder, and I'm still looking for a venue, but hopefully we'll come together. So on September 1st, I'm going to be running like, a full day event. Uh, we are I'm calling like Death Fest Fairgrounds uh, because I'm picturing like a fair where you have like different booths where you can go hang out. So I will be I will be doing the Flutter booth. So if you want to learn Flutter, uh, you can come and bring your laptop and then basically the idea is that you can go through CoLab and then I will help you if you're stuck or if you already kind of know, then I will set you up with like this project and you can help you. Or you can bring your own project. I'm not going to force free labor out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then there will be also a booth for TensorFlow if you're interested in machine learning, and then another one for Google Home, like Google Action, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, so if you go to meetup.com and look for GDG Boulder, which stands for Google Developer Group Boulder, I will also tweet about it. I think that will be the easiest that we all can also get followers. So I should put this up. So that, that thing in the corner, that's my Twitter handle. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about either TensorFlow or Flutter or Google Action, uh, sign up. And like I said, we should have a venue. If not, we'll have to reschedule. And I would love to see what you build with uh, Flutter and Firebase. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>